Tandy too. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, how, how's it going? You're, are you in the West Coast right now? Like you're in Cali? Yes, I am in wine country in California right now. Wow. That, yeah, um, it's a view over here. <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the tri-state area, so nothing too crazy. Yeah, um, I just came from there, so it's, it's definitely, it's definitely the, the views are different. <laughs> Well, glad that you you get in some R and R and that you're able to relax. Uh, we're we're gonna talk about a topic that is not so relaxing. Uh, <laughs> being a millennial, uh, it's it's interesting actually. I feel like whenever I'm doing a recording, like right before, there's always something that ends up happening that's kind of applicable to the conversation that I'm gonna end up having. And I was watching this video where they were talking about. Um, finances and like things that people can do uh, to be in a better place financially. And while they're talking about this, one thing that they harped on was how we're in a situation right now where a good portion of millennials are actually in a worse financial standing than their than their parents, than the generation before them. That's the first time that that's, that's ever happened. I think that's all you need to know about... <laughs> The, the millennials uh what are your what's your perspective what's your view on being a millennial millennial yourself it, I mean uh, I what you just said uh, the stat right there about that uh, we're in a worse financial standing than our parents kind of hits home to me um I, I'm staying at a place right now let's just say that in the in a huge house and something that I'm amongst my friends where everyone's about what the, in the late twenties and everyone just talks about how we will never be able to afford this house. And everyone has a good job. Everyone has a decent job, very good income. And we still kind of look at things like buying a house, getting married or having kids seems like very, very unreachable goals. So I feel like that's very discouraging, right? For both of us that work in kind of this corporate environment where we, we both have decent jobs for our age, but it just seems like a lot of these big life goals are seem really un, really unreachable, which is it kind of discourages you, especially within this pandemic and COVID time when everyone's thinking about what's the next step. So I think I think that's definitely that's definitely the real feeling amongst amongst our generation. Oh yeah, and I think you bring up a good point where you you talk about how um, when it comes to all these these life decisions that if you're in a better financial standing would be a pretty much a no-brainer but in, exactly. in, in this predicament it's not like something like having kids buying a home these are things that other generations were able to just do outright do without even thinking about it um exactly it's just that it's a next step we should just do it but it's not that easy for us what do you what do you think like, well, I guess, yeah, like, what, like, are, are there things that you think that were done in the generation before us that kind of impacts where we are today and the predicament that we're in? <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not, sh I'm not sure if they've done, I feel like they definitely lived their lives differently, at least with my, with my parents, um, being Im immigrant parents kind of coming here, they're, they're a lot more frugal. They don't really go on vacations um, as much, doesn't spend as much on themselves. But I think in terms of generational wealth and kind of being able to buy land, I think land is definitely more expensive to buy now than what, 50 years ago. So just, just the idea of having a house, I think I think if you think about growing up or adulting, quote unquote adulting, a lot of it kind of comes with those those thick life decisions, right? And I, I don't know. I feel like maybe because we feel like it's unreachable, reachable, we don't really we're not saving us as much for it, saving up as much for it. We're not looking at the ethical. So uh, I, I don't know. If maybe it's all the debt, all the debt they're <laughs> they're borrowing as well. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, the debt definitely. That, that people are garnering is a thing. Actually, uh, an episode, another episode that I did before this, I had a conversation where we were talking about how just culturally the idea of credit has kind of yeah. grown and people have become more and more comfortable with uh, buying, beyond their buying beyond their means. While I feel like 
prior to our generation, there was more of this notion of saving and actually outright getting what you want and, exactly. and not accruing that, that debt. Everything's on credit now. I, I don't know if you, you've seen on, the, um, on all of those econ, econ sites now, there's this new thing called like Afterpay in, in, in Karna or something, Kar, Kar, Karnara. And it's, it's, it's the, I think it's for the Gen Z generation where they want to buy certain things, but they don't want to use your credit card because, because of kind of the financial crisis they've seen and like what happens with credit. So it, it's interesting kind of seeing how each generation affects the next. Right. And, you know, like, so I, I want to, I want to dive into two things uh, really quick uh, before we, we move on. Boomers. I think that like, I'd love to get your POV on boomers and that generation and how that generation has impacted us. Because I, I think that they have to an extent with just when you look at, for instance, um, just the, the amount of debt that they accrued uh, when they were in power, the, the, the fact that we still have so many leaders from the boomer generation still holding mm -hmm. on to the control and the power of the country and that that uh, that reluctance to just pass the torch i think is kind of to the detriment of the the nation to the next generation yeah i mean if you think about kind of the current stimulus plan we're bar we're borrowing trillions of dollars from us to to kind of give out loans to small businesses. And these small businesses are probably the most millionaires within, within America. Like maybe maybe not the mom and pop shops, but like a, a, like a franchise with a couple of stores, they're living, they're living their life, they're living well, they're probably gaining wealth within, within their financial gains, within their stocks at this time, but they're still getting these PP, like um, getting these help from, and borrowing from generation like us and Gen Z. So. I feel like I feel like that doesn't that rings even louder and louder even during this time, yeah. especially during the pandemic. Yeah, and you know I was reading Andrew Yang's book, and uh, one thing that he talks about that definitely hit home was the fact that with the the amount of debt that we've accrued, with the uh, lack of innovation within the the next generations, it's it's going to be detrimental to the economy. Because as we were saying, so many people feel as if they don't have that ability to do the things that people in generations before could just outright do and like felt confident with, like, you know, starting a business, starting a family, all these other things. Everyone's so reluctant because of the amount of debt that they have that it's to the detriment of the economy because there's so many people who probably, if the situation were different, would start businesses, do all these things that would just be beneficial for everybody. Right. And, and I can totally imagine why. Like, imagine our generation growing up, seeing the OA financial crisis and, and then kind of bouncing back a little bit and then seeing all of this happen with, uh, during the pandemic. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of risk and, like, uncertainty about the future. I, I don't... I, I don't know what I think about the future, you know, and I can't imagine being a being a kid, uh, being a Gen Z, and growing up during this generation and seeing both of those. It's just, it's it, it definitely will impact you. I can imagine your future life choices for for a very long time. Right. And what are your thoughts in regards to technology and where our generation lies with like the the whole internet revolution and when we were young, like. How do you think that's impacted us? I feel like we're still living and it. We're still, we're still figuring it out, right? How it's impacting us. I, I know that every time I have a chance to not look at a phone recently, I just want to not, I, I want to get it, shut off all technology, <laughs> shut off. I, I want to be away. Every time I see a text message, it just seems like someone is, someone wants something from you. But I, I think honestly, we, we are in a really interesting generation where, we're the only generation that has seen what life is like pre-internet, pre-LimeWire. Right, right. <laughs> and, and then 
we are the generation that saw what happened with Google and all these new like social media platforms. So I think we're in a really interesting generation between the Gen Zs that really grew up with everything like with Facebook and then the generation before us where they saw they li really lived their life without technology. So I think that gives us an opportunity to be in this really interesting space and kind of the connector between the two. But I think technology has has definitely we, we've seen we've seen kind of the detriments that it, it's it's doing to everything kind of how false media and kind of you, you don't really believe anything that you read online I feel like that's kind of a sad thing where technology has made it so everything is so readily available but at the same time you don't know what to believe you don't know what's real oh yeah that those are all good points and I think you know we're both millennials and I I, I, I can attest to this like you know growing up you know, from like the age from birth to like what maybe when we were like, I want to say like 14, 15, I feel like the the iPhone became a thing like that was like maybe mm -hmm. 2000, like four or five or something, but like smartphones and all those things, that was kind of towards the 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 time where we were essentially about to go to college and everything and Facebook became very yeah. prominent and it's just really fascinating looking at the the generation after us and how they you know first and foremost are just so tech literate at a very young age and you know I think that like I think back to when I was younger and you know I've talked about this like on other episodes too like they're like we always wanted to go outside and and play and do all these other things it's like yeah, you wanted to play video games. That was definitely part of the equation as well. But like that face-to-face -face human interaction was like vital. And I feel like nowadays, mm -hmm. the 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 new generation, they can just like stay in a room and play uh, whatever that game is that they play. I forget. That's like super popular. We're like Fortnite. Fortnite. There you go. Well, well what do kids do play these days? <laughs> yeah, I sound like a fucking old man, but yeah, <laughs> Fortnite and like just playing these games and interacting and hanging out with your friends virtually. Like, it's 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 fascinating, and I think that it it creates a bit of a conundrum for us because I think psychologically you're kind of torn between those two mechanisms, and I feel like it's. It's both a good and bad thing, right? I guess. Yes. Yeah. I think it definitely the pros comes with the cons. And you know, I like I, I feel like we spoke about this offline before, but you know, one thing I always think about a lot is that <laughs> the, the world that we live in, like everything that 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 we have and that we perceive of and everything, it's all figments of our imagination, right? Like nothing truly exists like it only exists because we agree that it exists and I think that with technology and with the internet I think it's it's made that that line between what is real and what is not even blurrier you know what I mean that's interesting I've got, I haven't thought about it like that so it, or so that means that with VR and all these new technology and games kind of coming up, you can literally just live in the virtual world. You really don't need to be in reality. Yeah. Like, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's the future. I, I don't. I, I don't know if we talked about this, but I recently discovered some um like Korean and Chinese um sh like uh, shows that they, there's competitions that um, they actually take different different engineers. I think they, they build these like AR characters or AI like avatar characters. And they're supposed to be um, these new, new celebrities, new idols where you can really bring them home with you. That's like the whole concept of it. Instead of having, let's say like a Justin Bieber being, being a celebrity, you have an avatar that you love and, and like care for and like you love their personality. and. You can act, like you can like, really bring a piece of them home, and you can hang out with them, talk to them, and and that's kind of how they imagine socialization and kind of what the new generation likes. And when I saw that, I was like, "There's no way that this type of technology exists," but it does. It's it's a future. Then they're already there. That's bizarre. Have you that that makes you think of? Have you ever heard of that movie called Her? I have. 
Have you seen crazy it? concept? Crazy concept. Did you watch yes, it? I have seen it. Yeah. Oh my god. So yeah, like what you're talking about, like it kind of makes you think of that as well. And yes. that yes. that like if anyone listening, if you haven't seen that movie, you should watch it. It's Go it's watch kind it. of it's bizarre. <laughs> like you know, not to 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 ruin it or anything, but the the one scene that's like sticking in my head right now that's just insane. And like it just it it just shows you how we're losing touch with with our humanity where like so like you know the premise of the, sh- of the movie you know it's this guy who falls in love with um an artificial being all he has is the voice of this being and he you know i guess it kind of adapts and has its own quote unquote personality and learns and learns you. and yeah. yeah and there's a scene where she's getting concerned about their relationship and ends up basically finding a, a, a human woman who likes to basically be the like vessel for the artificial being to kind of be part of the relationship and kind of have some sort of symbiotic relationship with that entity. That is just like if, if we can't align on that being batshit fucking nuts, I'm very scared for this fucking species. Because that's insane. <laughs> that's insane. Is it not? I I feel like we're there. Uh, like honestly, I feel like at, at this point we're not we're not there at a con- at the stage where her is kind of representing it. But I mean, those those real life looking dolls and kind of combined with the whole concept of VR, I I just feel like the new age of porn the new age of all these things and and kind of like I don't know if you've heard of this but um like in in Japan if there's like a fertility issue crisis where people are not having kids and they're saying that a lot of these um a lot of the men in in Japan kind of there's a lot of these anime man manga like virtual type of things where they they feel happy with a computer being their companion rather than a real human so it doesn't seem like it's impossible. It doesn't seem like it's really out in the future. And it feels like in different parts of the world, I might be here already. That's that's not okay. Scary. That's scary. <laughs> that's, that's pretty scary. And aren't and they having... They, don't, they have fertility issues. <laughs> I was about to say that, yeah. Like, yeah. aren't they having... Like, like the, the the population is 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 going down and not enough people are procreating? Yeah, exactly. And, I, and they are link, linking some of these um, concerns to to things like this, where a lot of people are kind of staying at home a lot, not a lot of social interaction, where we're social beings, we, we should be outside, we should be interacting with people. So it's it's scary, but this is, I, I guess this is the dark side of technology, of course, you know? Right, and, and do you think that the the pandemic is kind of inadvertently uh, accelerating this, this, this trajectory? A hundred percent. I think things that was, businesses and people were planning on come like digitalization kind of coming forth like in the next 10 20 years got like rapidly accelerated just within our industry you kind of see that like a lot of companies are are moving away from even just having real offices and everything being virtual a lot of things kind of will shift with that I definitely I definitely feel like we've we've seen a really really fast change within the last year right and it's just the thing that just blows my mind, like, you know, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's this documentary on, on QAnon on HBO. I uh, did. Oh my God. Okay. Oh my Perfect. God. <laughs> so like, if you, if that's another thing. If you haven't watched that, I highly recommend that. It's, it's kind of fucking insane. I think the, 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 the biggest thing that, that like has stuck out to me so far in it was first and foremost, uh, I like that they addressed other crazy movements that that kind of happened accidentally before Q and how like yeah. it kind of was a build up to what we see now. It's I think that's the thing that's that's the that's a double edged sword about the internet, right? Like it's 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 great because it it helps us to, you know, do things more efficiently. It helps us to uh connect with people that aren't near near to us in a positive way. But on the flip side, it also allows all of the deep, dark, terrible things that people 
are like thinking and like want to do become reality it basically gives uh, a silent minority that like it outright doesn't have much power all of a sudden all of this level of control and ability to create movements that are catastrophic yes i a hundred percent agree I, I think that was the biggest the big, biggest feeling after watching the watching that movie was or the documentary was the exact same thing these people wouldn't have these platform without 4chan a chan or all these kind of forms and at the end of the day you don't i didn't realize there were so many ignorant and sorry excuse my french stupid people out there where sometimes you you maybe you shouldn't have a voice to be able to kind of get, gather and kind of group and get together and kind of do these things like rape the capital or like have these crazy movements where you where you're bringing a rifle to a pizza place it's just it's insane it's crazy and the, it's the crazy. and the thing that's unfortunate about it cuz you know i think that you know, once the once the 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 cat like the genie bottle has been opened, you can't put it back. And mm -hmm. it's one of those things too, where you know, freedom of speech is 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 vital, and like it's a slippery slope when you try to censor one people over another. And I think that with censorship, the thing that makes it hard is that if you censor something and if you like prohibit something, you only fan the flames and make it bigger. So I, I don't even know how this is something that can even be resolved. And yeah. it's, it's, it's terrifying. It's, it's kind of terrifying. Um, and, you know, I think back, circling back to what we were saying in regards to how we're kind of the, the generation that bridges the gap between the generation that was more, well, that was less tech savvy and less, and like, you know, internet didn't, and uh, didn't, uh, exist and the generation that's super tech savvy and like all in on the internet like mm -hmm. do you think that there's something that will end up be being our responsibility to kind of mitigate this given that you know the generations prior to us will cease to exist eventually yeah I I 100 I think so I think it's it kind of leads up to us to figure out what are the good parts that we want to keep with life without technology that the boomers and the generation before us had. Like, I think this pandemic at least has really taught me that being outside in nature, you just, you as a human, how you feel when you step outside and actually breathe a fresh, fresh breath of air, that feeling is maybe it's just as you get older, that's, that's something that you start to appreciate as well. But I think things like this, like when we when we have kids, when we see the next generation, I feel like these are the things where we need to kind of pick and choose and figure out what are, what are things that maybe we leave, let the low generation die, die out, leave behind the racism, and all the craziness. But there are things that I feel like we can definitely pick and choose. And I feel like we're that generation that we're because we've seen what it was like before and what it's like now. We're, we're at a prime place. Where we're able to kind of like pick and choose. Right. No, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, it's one of those things where it's really interesting when you, when you, when you look at it and you, you look at who we are, what we have to do, uh, what, yes. what the future, like what, what lies ahead in the future. Because like, I think as human beings, and I think that we're, we're kind of losing touch with that right now, but like the whole point is the future, is the next generation. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, when you put any generation in a situation where it's harder for them to uh, make those choices and make those decisions for the future, it's to the detriment of everyone, not just the, the people that exist right now, but the people who will hopefully, God willing, exist uh, moving forward. And I think that, you know, not to completely shit on boomers, but I do think that a lot of the things that were done by the boomers has put this in like has put civilization in general in a really, really yeah. tough and bad predicament. When you look at climate change, when you look yeah. at when you look at, you know, the economy and like just like the level of greed that was that, that was inflicted, I just feel like as human beings, the like it's just in, like the the whole like within our DNA, everything is about 
appropriation, like whether we, we like want it to be or not, like obviously some people given our level of consciousness kind of uh, bat it away and ignore it. But like deep down, that's, that's the whole point. The whole point is mm-hmm. the next generation. And I think that bloomers lost sight of that, got greedy, like, cause in addition to like it being about the next generation, as far as setting them up, it's also about passing the torch to the next generation and making sure that there's ample presence, ample leadership, ample preparation for them to take on those responsibilities because you're not going to be here uh, moving forward. Why on earth do we have a fucking, like, sorry to shit on the president, why on earth do we have a, a dude that's on death's doornail or doorknob or however the fuck you say that expression <laughs> as the president of the United States? It's insane. For like eight years, like this is going to be eight years now that we've had someone that's like over 70 as president. And like, while I get it, like you definitely, you know, you have knowledge and all these other things, but also a lot of the problems that we have were inflicted because of you. So why are you the one that's supposed to solve them? Like, it doesn't make any sense. I I think, I think that generation kind of like lost sight in a, in a, in a concept of, oh, let, let me make money. Let me, let me accumulate as much wealth as I can. And I can pass it out to my own kids and my own generation. Fuck the rest of the people. I think that's, I think that's a concept. Hopefully our generation starts to think about, hey, how, how a middle-class kid does and how much they're able to afford really affects me no matter how much I, I make. Because if I walk out the street and there's homeless people anywhere, that's not a good environment for my kids. But I think that generation didn't think about things like that, didn't think about kind of social welfare and like, how infrastructure really makes a difference where like we're in we're in America there's our infrastructure should not be this in at this quality why are we not investing as much in healthcare and infrastructure and kind of the quality of life it's it's not a matter mad only a matter of accumulating your own wealth it's kind of wealth for everyone and like you want to have a community where everyone's thriving then that's when you really really thrive right and I think that 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 kind of ties really well into the notion that I have in regards to the the difference like i feel like the the big difference between the united states and for instance uh like china or russia is that you know and i'm not saying like that all of this is good (laughs) but uh in the united states i think that there is this and like i've I've talked about this on other episodes too the united states there's this 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 obsession with the individual with the, like yes. the, the the self like and I think sometimes it's to our own detriment because like you look at a place like China and like I'm saying I'm not saying you know we should be socialist or communist but like <laughs> I think the thing about China that like you you look at and you you see more efficiency in is that there is this notion that there's something greater than yourself and yes. that it's about the collective unit and not the individual And I think that when you look at that, it makes sense that, for instance, during the pandemic, they were able to, like, build this, like, crazy hospital and all these things in a span of, like, 12 days or some shit. Like, I don't know how long, but it was super fast. But then the United States of America in California, it, it takes, like, fucking 13, 20 years to build a fucking highway. Like, are you fucking kidding me? I think that, you know, that there's there's an issue there where we we don't like take into account the community and like everyone and it's all about you I I 100% agree being Chinese myself and I kind of hearing about what was going like during this whole entire year like hearing about how fast Korea China Taiwan all those countries even going beyond just building a hospital just as simple as wearing a mask those communities, I, I think it's just, they have a tribe, not a tribal, I mean, I think all humans are kind of like, we're innately kind of a tri- tribal people. We like being a human community, that's what, how we thrive. But that that sense is really, really highlighted in Asian countries, or maybe even Euro- European countries, I'm not sure, but in Asian countries, for sure. Like in China, I think it was a lot of help us help you, you know? And that message really, really resonated with everyone. It was like, what's the what's the worst that could happen for me to put on a mask to help myself help my grandma help your grandma I think it's just a matter of you walk you walk down the street and you say hi to your neighbor and say okay I know I know 
the grandma that might be suffering. So I think it's it, that concept where it's very different from here. And I think, and I think that's, that's also something that um, like I, I feel like is pros and cons with individualism, right? That's why there's a lot of ideas coming out here, coming out from America, why Facebook started here, Google, all this innovation, but there's always kind of a con that comes with every every bright, <laughs> yeah, bright light yeah. with freedom yeah. and individualism. Yeah, it's definitely a double-edged sword. And, you know, there's, For sure. there, there's good aspects of it and there's bad. I, I know... Um, uh, another episode I did earlier this year uh, where we were talking about aging, uh, one thing that I highlighted, uh, which is it because, like, you know, the the boomers right now, like Alzheimer's and everything, that's going to be something that's going to really hit our our hospitals hard when when that time comes and is coming. Uh, right. And it's just very interesting because, you know, when we were having that discussion, I, I highlighted, you know, similar to what we're talking about right now, how you know, when it comes to the the previous generation, they're definitely, you know, like in Eastern culture, there's more of this, uh, I don't even want to say expectation, but just this out, like it's it's done almost subconsciously where the the younger generation is going to look after like their, their parents and like they're going to take care yeah. of them. And then like when you look at the United States, for instance, or like West, yeah, I'd say more so the United States, but there's that that's not necessarily the case it's like get them the fuck in a home i don't want to deal with them like yeah there there's just this this disconnect it seems like with us where we and i i don't know if it's if it's just like with it embedded into our culture and just i guess how we're we're kind of trained at a young age just based off of uh how our capitalistic society works but it's definitely uh something that i think like you were saying, it's a double-edged sword. I think I would argue that uh, there's probably a bit more negatives than positives, though. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there's the, the idea that there's a whole industry kind of thriving off of nursing home and like care is that concept is really it, it's it's scary to me. Where an old where like I can't imagine my give putting my parents in a home where they don't know anyone there where how do I how do I trust these people that are quote unquote professionals taking care of my parents health or like welfare and things like that it just I I don't know if you I don't know if you've um, heard of these news kind of about these caretakers really like they can really take full responsibility and phone ownership or like uh, um, guardianship of these older people. And they really take advantage of these people. And I'm not saying this whole industry is like this, but when it comes to human beings, there's always bad apples within every industry. So like just just the fact of uh, putting your parents in that situation where they might be being under a care of someone that's not really there for their for their well-being is, is a really scary concept to me. And I think, but to be honest, I think even in Asia, I think, the concept of taking care of your parents has evolved. I think home, like nursing homes are starting to like exist there too. So maybe it's just a generational thing where um, things are changing. But I think in the Eastern culture, there's definitely a huge emphasis on respecting your elders, taking care of your elders and things like that. Right. Well, yeah. You know, like even in Japan, they like have, I remember I watched this documentary where like they have these towns where uh, like, old people like people live very long like 90 plus like and like they years old yeah and like they they like uh like all the young people visit them and give them gifts and like it's mm-hmm. it's something to aspire and to to honor uh, yeah. in that in, in that that area and I just find that very interesting and I think I guess jumping into another topic I'm curious your thoughts in regards to just uh culture culture uh, and the changes that are happening right now, uh, you know, just taking into account um, a lot of the things that have happened during the pandemic, how we're becoming more uh, cognizant to some of the, the, you know, things that are going on, uh, whether it be racially and things like that. Do you think that we're, we're moving in the right direction societally in regards to these things? In my perspective, I would love to hear your perspective on this too. I feel like this might be a very jaded way of thinking about this is 
I feel like, yes, we are definitely, each generation, I think we get better and better, but also at the same time, you also see that history repeats itself. So in a way, I'm, I'm torn in this, in this stage of, yes, think there's media, and I think part of in the internet technology is that their awareness is starting to kind of grow and be there and where like the Black, Black, Black Lives Matters movement or this anti-Asian hate movement wouldn't really exist in the main media if things like social media didn't really push for it, right? I feel like NBC, CNN, maybe they're, they wouldn't cover things like this as much if it, were, if it weren't for technology. But at the same time, how is this different from like the 92 um, LA riots and how is this like things are kind of repeating itself so I'm at a food stage where it's like is this human nature is this us can we get better um so I'm curious about your thoughts <laughs> yeah oh man okay my, my thoughts uh it's very, it's very okay uh, we're gonna need a few <laughs> minutes for this uh, yeah <laughs> well first off before I even get to that you know in regards to like uh the, the anti-Asian movement um, and everything that's going on there. You know, one thing I, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on this too, but like I was watching this video and uh, it was this Asian American guy who was talking uh, with uh, like a group of his friends, like a white guy, black guy. And like, they, they were like talking about uh, the, the, the interesting predicament that, that you can be in uh, when being an Asian um, American. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because basically, and, and I, I think I agree with this, that the, the, the guy, they're basically getting to, alluding to the point that when you're in America, basically it's, it's you know, for lack of a better word, it's black and white. It's, it's very black and white. And anything in between that, there seems to be this hesitance to outright acknowledge that that any other individual outside of that is actually American like I feel like there's a, a, mm -hmm. a tendency when like you see an Asian person like you know I don't do this I'm from New York but like I feel like New York is different but like when people see like an Asian it's like oh like where are you from where are and, you from yeah, yeah. and it's <laughs> like the, the, they'll be like you know San Francisco and then they'll be like no where are you really from there, there's this other aspect where mm -hmm. for some reason, uh, uh, as much as, as Asians have, um, you know, uh, been able to uh, embed themselves within the cult, within the society, within the culture, they haven't fully been accepted. And uh, a lot of the times it's interesting, statistically, like you see that uh, Asians actually uh, percentage wise uh, end up going to like the military at a higher rate and all these other things because these are things that once you do it there's no denying that you're part of the nation and it's just very it's very fascinating how how human beings work and like the psychological element of it where there's just this notion that like because you're not like prominently uh presented within uh within the culture as far as media and thing goes, it kind of mm -hmm. creates this perception that you're not one of us. And it's, it's just fascinating to me how people think. And it's, it's kind of hard because it's like when I hear these things and I'm listening to these things, I can see it, but I can't like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I can't relate to it because that's not how I was grew up. And that's not like what I was exposed right. to because I lived in New York City, but the majority of, of America that's exactly their perception. Exactly, and I and and I think that that's like a testament to how powerful media is, right? Like the the fact that when you really think about the, when you really think about everything that's happened in the past year, it's just we're it just seems like we're simple humans at this point, right? If I don't look like you, I am not in the same group, or I am not on your side. It kind of feels like when it comes when it comes to a worldwide pan pandemic that's kind of how everyone's kind of start to kind of go into their own groups it seems like instead of banding together and working through this together together and figuring out how do we help help us help you you know we kind of go back in our own groups and kind of feel and point at each other and saying that this is your fault this is your fault like it's because of you this is why it's happening and it's it, it's wild thinking that all of it really just has to do with how you look it really right. doesn't matter what it's on a piece of paper. 
right? Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's all it comes down to. Yeah. It's, it's and unfortunate. And that's just us simple humans, I guess. That's when it comes down to a lot of these issues and things that we deal with, it just seems like, wow, we just, we really take things by face value. Right. And, you know, to, to, to go back to like my, my POV on the question I asked you, yeah, I, I'm a bit torn in regards to whether or not we're going in the right direction or not. I think if I, if I have to like say yes or no, I'd probably say no. Uh, but, but like, wow. but, but my answer is, but like my, my reasoning and like my thought is it's very uh, nuanced. I, I'd say that there are things that are positive. And I think that, you know, to your point, like we were saying before, technology has opened our eyes up to a lot of things that we may not have been as privy to in the, in, in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, things would have been like buried and things are now exposed and we're all aware of these things at a, at a higher level. But at the same time, I think that one of the things that that kind of frightens me is that, um, you know, with the internet, like, and on both sides of the spectrum, I think that, you know, how we were talking about earlier, how like a silent, like a, a small minority has the power of an army because of the internet. I think that it works in both ways. Like whether you're talking yes. about like an extremist that's, you know, um, gonna like do all these crazy far right things I think that you can kind of say the same thing to an extent on the other side of the pendulum with you know Antifa or with like these this like this innate um tendency of you know just absolute cancel culture of if you do anything wrong basically you're just irredeemable or like you know the like I I think that it's a bit of an overcorrection at times and I think that uh, in my opinion, I think that the overwhelming majority of people are decent and will mess up at times, but I think that their heart is in the right direction. I think that the people who skew on the extremes on the other sides are the, the minority and not the majority, but they have the Agreed. biggest microphones. And I think that- They have the loudest voices. Yeah, they have the loudest voices. And my yeah. fear, and like what I, from what I see that fear that, that scares me is that we like while there are movements that I think are important that and that uh, deserve air, I think that we're becoming more and more divided and that and we're going in a direction and we're uh, we're approaching things. Some of us at least are approaching things in a way that I think is actually uh, detrimental and not helpful uh, to what I think I, I would assume and I, and I would hope is the goal. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is that the the people who actually do like and pursue these these movements and that pursue uh, these things on behalf of others? I think that while they may believe that they that they have good intentions, I think that mm-hmm. deep down it's not. And I think that history has kind of shown that you know, like I think that a lot of times the intellectuals, the the people who have the platform, are the ones who are able to administer these movements. And I don't think that their hearts are ever in the the right place. And I think that it's never about the actual movement and it's about themselves and about the power that they're able to garner. I think that, you know, it's just, it's just a, a, a simple fact of life that I think human beings, like when things are, are going well, it's easy for us to congregate and collaborate with people who are different from us. When resources right. are minimal and minuscule, that's when we start yeah. to see the differences in, in, in others more. And like you, you start to see the other, like the person as the other. And I think yes. that it, it brews this environment of conspiracy theories becoming more and more rampant. Everyone, I think during times like this, like not everyone, but like I think a lot of people want to feel as if they know something that other people don't know. And I think mm-hmm. that's, that's why you have mo- like movements like Q and all these other things and all these wild outlandish things that people gravitate towards because they feel like they don't have any power. They don't have any say, they don't have any control and feeling as if you know something that the rest of society doesn't know or doesn't believe kind of- Makes you feel powerful. You. Yeah, it makes you feel powerful. Right. right. I've never thought about it, but that's very true. That's a, it, because you you kind of you want to understand why you are in the situation you're in, right? I, I think we're all kind of just trying to look for answers. How do you how do you get there? How do you get 
to be a, a millionaire kind of growing your wealth during this time rather than not and I think what they going back to kind of the Q documentary if it, they feel the people that believers are of Q feel like they understand why it's because these people are doing all these crazy things and that's why and they're bad but I think it, it, it's just it's all that fault the power of media with all everything that we talk about it's just it, it's insane how much it can really it changes our mind it can influence our actions it's just it's insane yeah and you know I think when you add to the mix that like you know there are some people who you know are involuntarily celibate who you know may have uh, all sorts of things that are going wrong in their life and that you know you look at society and you look at culture and this is the thing that that makes culture very very important culture kind of dictates uh what is acceptable what is the the standard and based off of that standard it can either make or break an individual's perception of their reality you know like if you yes. if you live in a society okay. where it's abnormal to like not be a virgin at the age of 25 it's probably going to make you feel a type of way if you're a virgin and you don't have yeah. any prospects and you're probably going to kill a bunch of people versus if you live in a society <laughs> it's true versus like if yeah. you live in a society where it's it's a-okay it's super normal like it's not a big deal and it's accepted it's going to make you feel more secure and more okay with your predicament because you're not looked at in society as this weirdo. And I think that we, we take for granted how impactful uh, media is, how impactful you know, stories are, and like how impactful it is to just make an environment where people don't feel as if they're an outsider. Because I think that's, that's how we get situations like we're in now, where you just have a whole bunch of people who have been uh, rejected by society and because of that now they want to do crazy shit yeah I, I totally agree I, I think I think in a way there's there's definitely positives to kind of how media how you can use the power of media right I think I was talking to a friend about this about um how just it's like super and in, like full entertainment like the movie Black Panther how much that Marvel movie gave like empowerment to the African-American community because of the fact of hey this is your culture this is this is something that could that could be beautiful and something that you should be proud of it's something that maybe for Asians like Middle Eastern um these people like our ethnicity maybe these are the other characters that need to show up on screen to empower to empower this generation to uh, let other ethnicities see oh this the way that it could be is beautiful and kind of um it's a different way of showing that showing that hey we're there are differences but you can be empowered you can feel like they're a part part of you and this is great it's a great thing that everyone can kind of work together and um and celebrate like differences and that's what makes america great you know not going back to the to the what 70s <laughs> yeah no yeah absolutely and i think uh it's just the the thing that that's just you know going back to what i said before nothing is real <laughs> like I think that that's that that's the thing that, that that's what we, we have... learn these days. Well, yeah, like I think that's that's the thing that I think if if we all like it's 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 a slippery slope, right? Because like you, you don't want to like ha have people think about that too much to the point where we no longer become productive. But like I think to an extent it's important to kind of ground ourselves and and acknowledge that everything is basically a figment of our imagination and it's just a manifestation of yes. our evolution and the fact that it's, it's, it's remarkable, don't get me wrong. It's why we were able to dominate the, the planet like we have, because we can conceive of things that don't exist in our mind and it allows us to build and create all these incredible things. But at the same time, you have to recognize that a lot of the things that we also create wars and all these other things based off of don't exist. A country is not real. A country only exists because a collective group of people agree that it exists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like uh, freaking a company doesn't exist. It only exists because we agree that it exists. Money doesn't exist. None of these mm -hmm. things exist. Race doesn't exist. All these things are, are just constructs within our mind. And I think that we just need to 
keep that in mind and like i'm not saying like get rid of those things and everything but understand that like it it shouldn't control you you should control it and we need to make sure that these imaginary things are working in our favor not against us yes you can pick and choose we have the choice yeah and last thing i want to talk about with you is mental health cuz i think that you know, within our generation of other generations, but I want to focus more on our generation. I do think that there is this, this um, uptick of mental health being uh, a bit more uh, problematic for us. I think that, you know, with the, the amount of money that, that like where we're not making, like a lot of us aren't making the financial situations, everything, those things matter and they, they build stress and yeah, just like maybe like if you wanted to just like elaborate on like your perspective on it, like maybe your experience and everything. Yeah, um, I'm, I would love to hear your experience, but I, I think I was recently kind of digging a little bit more into this um, because I feel like within during this past year, my anxiety has increased, has has been just kind of anxious about everything. And I think going back, kind of tying everything back to media and technology, I think parts of it really do have to do with exposure. What you don't know, you don't fear, right? Because we see we see what's going on across the world. We see like people kind of getting getting killed, like cops are killing people on the streets. Like people are kind of going around like like hurting other people for no reason for just how they look. I think seeing those things, yeah, having those exposure kind of increases your anxiety, increases your fear of the outside world but at the same time it kind of in a way it's good that we're aware but at the same time like it kind of pushes us to kind of really deal with our mental health because coming from an Asian culture I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if um, it's the same that it's the same as um, American culture or like it, it's different between white and black I'm sure but um, within within Asian culture it's always when you talk to my parents generation they always say walk it off it's fine. You deal with it. Tough it out. It like you don't need to talk to someone. To, like go and do it. Like you don't have to think too much about it. It's a it's a lot of that concept. So I think in the Asian culture, they're still very slow to kind of get into the whole like meditation, self help, talking to someone that really helps you. But I think that's what's good about the Western culture at this point. Where I think I think here. You're, we're at the beginning steps of, of taking mental health as, as as a priority, and I think and it and it's still and it has, still has been a long time coming. So, I feel like it's good that we're at this place where where people are more openly talking about it. But at the same time, we kind of have to be aware of the triggers, right? It's these things that we consume, it's these things that we see, um, and it's I guess there's no way to really stop them unless you really quit everything cold turkey. Right. So yeah, I. Totally agree. I feel like, uh, like I feel like initially, like when the pandemic started, I thought that like I was like good. I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. I'll Facetime people. I'll you know right. watch things on Netflix. But I think I really took for granted uh, how much of a social human being I am, and how much I enjoy uh, being around people, being in the office when we work together, fucking around going to get water, talking shit. Uh, yeah. There's something that's different about doing that in person versus virtually. Like virtually, don't get me wrong, like it's it's nice to like have that. And like, I feel lucky to like have people uh, that I can do that with, but it's different. And I think that that was pretty hard to, to kind of adapt to. I think also for me personally, like, you know, living in the city, living in a studio, I think, when things are out and about, like when you're out and about and things are, you know, running normally, it's not even something that's, that's an issue because you're spending yeah. so little you're time there. Yeah. You're distracted. You're hardly there. Yeah. But then it's like, once the pandemic happened, it's like, that's where you were all the time. And yeah. it, it just really changed my mindset in regards to living in the city. And like, statistically, that's becoming a thing now. I'll also, I know we didn't really talk about that, but you know, uh, millennials are actually uh, looking to be more rural and spread out. And that's something that is expected to drastically change. But um, yeah, like, I think that, you know, mental health is huge. Like, I definitely had a lot of moments of anxiety, a lot of moments where I, I felt 
this need to kind of reevaluate where I'm at, what's important yes. to me. Uh, exactly. I think I think that um, that was probably something that a lot of people um, dealt with during this pandemic. And I think that you know, as, as like a as a black man, I feel like you know, in 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 like the black community, like mental health is definitely something that I, that I don't think really gets much attention. And I remember there was this yeah. uh, ba a basketball player who uh, came out like during the pandemic talking about like how hard it was for him and how he suffers from depression and like, mm -hmm. you know, wanted to basically like be a model of like, you know, saying it's okay to go to a therapist. It's okay to talk to somebody and, you know, address your issues. And I think that we are going in a good direction in regards to making it more mainstream to deal with your shit. I, I try to meditate at least once or twice a day. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I could actually like, meditate like a half hour plus. Like I was trying to meditate with my wow. girlfriend. I was like meditating with my girlfriend. And I put it on for a half hour and like, she's like, is this going to be over? And then she's like, she's, like you're, <laughs> you're good. And it's like, I think that, you know, med like at least for me, like what I like about meditation is that like it, like I use Headspace and like, I feel like it really does help you to get out of your body for, for a moment. And yeah. you, it, it's kind of amazing. Like while you're doing it, like if you really focus, like for at least a couple of minutes, it's like you, you're not thinking about anything. You're not like focusing on all of the, the nonsense of the world. And like you, you're just, you're present and you're okay. And like, you're, you're, you're just for, for even for like a minute or two, you're, you're just one with, with everything and just not at all, you know, concerned with all of the, the chaos and bullshit of life. And yes. I, you just convinced me that after this, I'm going to go meditate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Please meditate. And, and I think that, you know, on top of that, it, it really just made me realize how important being one with nature is like you were saying before, yes, like, I think definitely. that's something that, you know, I think it's, it's a combination of the pandemic and also getting older that I think we start to realize, you know, the things that, that matter and like the moments that matter. And, you know, I think being one of nature, getting your air, getting all those things, it's a game changer. It's incredible. Like, and like when yeah. you're, when you're outside of the city and like the air is fresh and everything, it, it really makes a different huge, feeling. Yeah, different feeling. So different feeling. yeah, I, I think mental health is really, really important. And, you yeah. know, I think that it, like, and I think this goes back to technology. There's so many distractions. Yeah. There's so much to, to consume that I think that it's hard to, to think, okay, I need to just stop and just, you know, meditate, do something because like Got we're outside. all, yeah, go outside. Like we're all like, you know, we're in the gig economy, all these things. It's like, you're all like, you're, you're supposed to like be on a device and just doing something nonstop. And you're supposed to be optimizing your life every second of your, of your life and everything. And I feel like it, I think it goes, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it's like, when it comes to human nature, where we're supposed to, we were put here to procreate, like you said, we're put here to swim in the ocean fucking pick berries off the off the trees no wonder we have mental health issues because we're trapped in a city where we're living on top of each other staring at screens all day when we're supposed to be out here like picking grapes off the off trees and eating them so I, I feel like it's all it's, it's all kind of coming together and I feel like for for our generation maybe that's why we've been hit a lot during this pandemic where we're we're kind of starting to be at an age where we're starting to see all these things and then now we have to evaluate wow everything that we were taught since we were growing growing up till now where hey you have to get into a good school study get into a good school get into a good job and then you'll be happy crap we're here we're at a good job but we're not happy <laughs> <laughs> this is not what you we were we signed up for what were you talking about right <laughs> It feels like it feels like we've been tricked. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's so true. It's like, yeah, you know, like you got like all you need to do is just do the right things, get that job, and you're gonna exactly. be good. Like you see exactly. the movies. You'll be happy. Yeah, yeah, you'll be you'll be good. Everything will be great. It's like, uh, are you good? <laughs> nah, yeah. Uh, if 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 uh, I won the lotto, I'd be good. <laughs> if I if I wasn't staring at a screen and still kind of living out my life. 
life. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's definitely it definitely were maybe that's kind of our opportunity at our our generation where we're, we're starting to figure out okay maybe maybe what what the older generation has been teaching us is not exactly it we got to figure out our own, our own path our own truth and what's the best way to live right and you know what would you what would you I guess what would be your advice to like anyone who's listening who you know is a millennial maybe they're they're older or maybe they're younger of just what are some things that they could do to you know be in a better place than they may be right now um honestly I don't I don't know if I'm in a best place to give advice but I think I can definitely um say things that's helped me and like kind of thoughts that's really helped yeah. me within the past couple of the past year is just not question everything exactly, but um, reevaluate what we've been taught. Reevaluate what really makes you happy. I think for me and you, we, me and you talked about this, where we're both at kind of a managing type of level within our industries, but at, at the same time, we're making a good amount of money, but is that what makes us happy? Like, is being in a city what makes you happy? Even though everyone kind of like growing up, they're telling you need to be in this great job and this great environment. You need to kind of like make a certain six figures and things like that. It, I think is really about reevaluating that. If you're someone that loves to be outside and you love like kind of interacting with nature, don't fall into the trap of thinking that you need to work a corporate life. I don't, I, I think that's, there's some people that that's these kind of jobs are made for, but it's really not for everyone. It's to kind of really question what the things that you've seen in the media and the things that you've been taught and just figure out your own path. I think that's, that's something that has really helped me. And I think that's kind of the journey that we're going to be on for a while. No, yeah, I 100% agree. I think that, you know, that that's that's def I think that there was a quote unquote awakening during the pandemic. And I think that a lot of people mm -hmm. are, you know, still in the process of that probably of really figuring out what it is that uh they do want. And like I think that people are, you know, slowly but surely in that direction. And yeah, I agree. I think this whole notion of, you know, there's a template, there's a one size fits all template for everyone yeah. on on what you should and shouldn't do in order to like live a happy and prosperous life is right. nonsense uh bullshit I, throw it it's out bullshit. yeah okay yeah it's bullshit it's bullshit <laughs> and you know yeah we got to get out of that that you know habit of thinking that way and really just uh you know find within like what what makes sense for you because what makes sense for you may not be applicable to the next person but if, right, if right. it's going to give you fulfillment, if it's going to make you happy, um, obviously it has to be somewhat sustainable. So be pragmatic, but yes. you know, do what you need to <laughs> we do. We still live though. in the society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to just live in the woods and, you know, do that shit, then, you know, go right ahead. Yeah. I know. I mean, if you can, assist, if you can sustain yourself as much as I love to be able to live in the woods, I know for a fact that I will not be able to catch no prey, you know, so <laughs> you have, you have to know your limits too. So exactly. I think it's finding that, that balance. <laughs> exactly. Tandy too. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We got to do this again soon. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this has been a pleasure. Oh yeah. This was awesome.